it's a big end. Before I start this one, I just want to say that I've heard this name pronounced like 90 different ways. So I'm going to be going with Alcala because that's what I've heard the most. But it could be wrong. And if it is, I apologize. Bear with me. The Alcala has five to eight confirmed kills depending on like who you ask. But he almost certainly killed more people than that. Um, on Wikipedia, it says that his estimated, like, the top number that his kill count could be is 103. So, it's insane. And Rodney Alcala's camera had pictures of a bunch of unidentified women and boys. And I am going to be placing those pictures throughout this video. And if you recognize a face, hit up the FBI, I guess. Alcala did not have the horrific upbringing that is characteristic in a lot of serial killers. The biggest worst thing that I found is that his dad left the family when he was a teenager. But when he was in his 20s, his dad passed away and he and all of the siblings went to the funeral. So it seems like they had contact with the dad. The dad just like didn't live there. I'm not really gonna get any further into his personal life and backstory because there is just so much murder to cover. So let's hop right into it. This first one is actually not a murder because she lived, thank God, but like her name was Tally Shapiro and she was eight years old when this happened. Tally was walking home from school and Rodney Alcala was in his car and he stopped next to her and he said, hey, do you need a ride? And Tally is smart. She knows not to talk to strangers. So she's like, no thanks. Like I'm not supposed to be talking to people that I don't know. And Rodney is prepared for this. And he says, oh, but I talked to your parents. Your parents know me like they've told me that it's okay for me to give you a ride home. And Tally's like, well, like if you talk to my parents, like then it should be fine, right? And so she gets into the car, but unbeknownst to Rodney, there is a woman who was nearby who watched this little eight year old girl get into this strange man's car and she called the police. So the police immediately are on this luckily and they track down Rodney's house and the police show up, they knock on the door and Rodney answers. He doesn't open the door. He just like kind of shouts through the door and he's like, hey, I just got out of the shower. Give me a minute. And they're like, mm, I'll give you 10 seconds. 10 seconds pass by. Rodney does not come to the door. And so they just open the door and they find the bloody body of a little girl. He has Tally. lost so much blood. There's a picture of her little white Mary Jane's next to the metal bar that he attacked her with. It's just, it's horrific. And so they assume that she has to be dead because there's just so much blood everywhere. And so they leave her, she's evidence, they don't want to touch her. So they leave her there and they go looking for Rodney. But then after they started looking, they hear this sort of gurgling noise and that's when they realize that Tally is alive. So obviously at this point, their first priority is to get Tally the medical attention that she needs. And they do lose Rodney, but Tally survives. And um, they find his identification number and his documentation in the house. So they know that the person they're looking for is Rodney Alcala. And that's the first time that he is um, that, pe that the authorities become aware. He has escaped, he's changed his name, moved across the country, is nowhere to be found. Tally is in the hospital for a long time. And when she finally gets out, her parents and her family are so traumatized, they don't wanna live in this house anymore, in this area that's so close to where she got attacked. And so the whole family just packs up and moves to Mexico. Meanwhile, he has changed his name to John Berger and he is working at a girl's summer camp 
for the arts as like a photography instructor. I didn't find this out until 2011, but around the same time that he attacked Cal Tally, he also attacked and murdered a woman named Cornelia Michael Crilly. She was a 23 year old flight attendant. He broke into her apartment and raped and murdered. He's working at this camp for little girls. Meanwhile, he has attacked this eight year old girl within an inch of her life and murdered this 23 year old woman. And he, at this point, is on the list of 10 most wanted fugitives on the FBI. And so one day, campers, a couple of campers from this camp that he's working at, they go to the post office and they see their instructor's face on the FBI top 10 most wanted list. And so they report it to the guy who's working at the camp. He reports it to the FBI and the FBI catches him. As I mentioned earlier, Tally and her family have all moved to Mexico at this point and they're not coming back to testify at trial. They don't want Tally to testify at trial. And from the outside, you might think, why would you not want this guy to be put away? But I obviously, like, my experience was nothing comparable to what happened to Tally. But I have testified in court as the victim of crime. And it was horrible. Like, the worst thing. that It's so re-traumatizing. It'll mess you up. She's 11 at this point. She's reliving this horrible thing from three years ago. They don't want her to put her through it. And it makes sense. And so she doesn't testify. But because she doesn't testify, he ends up getting off with a plea deal for child molestation. He is sentenced to one year to life. And the parole board lets him out after just under three He's years. released for attacking Tally within two months. He is arrested again for attacking a 13 year old girl using the same methods that he used to attack Tally. And he gets out after two more so years. At this point, he's been released after his two year term and he is on parole. And while you're on parole, usually you're not permitted to travel out of the state, but his parole officer allows him to travel to New York City. And when he goes to New York City, he kills a woman a 23-year-old woman named Ellen Jane Hover. Now, Ellen is the daughter of a very prominent family, very privileged, and so her murder is a huge deal. They publicly. don't find out that he's the one who killed her until way later. So in 1978, he gets arrested and serves time for marijuana possession, which, like, who cares? But here's why I care, okay? Is because the reason he was caught for marijuana possession is because he had taken this little girl and was giving her pot and was smoking with her and was probably considering the things that he had done before going to get this girl high and attack her All so right, that's this that. time is when a lot of the pictures that were found in his camera were taken because he was telling women that he was a fashion photographer and he was taking photos of just any woman who would agree to get their photo taken by him. And a lot of these photos were nude photos and we don't know how many of those women ended up being murdered. And at this point, here's the bit that everybody talks about and that everybody makes a big deal out of. He was on a reality show called The Dating Game in 1978. And it was like a dating show where they have one woman on and they have three or four bachelors. And you don't get to see the bachelors you don't get to know their names or their occupations or anything like that. You get to ask them questions and they're usually like sexually explicit questions, like sexually explicit for 1978. And then at the end, the girl chooses which one to go on a date with. And Rodney Alcala was the one who was chosen to go on a date with her. And she luckily did not end up going on this date with him because she spoke to him after the show was done and she realized that he was a creepy creep. And so she talked to the production people of the show and she was like, look, you can tell him whatever you want, give whatever excuse you need to. I'm not going because he he makes me really uncomfortable. And that might have saved her life that she didn't go with him. But at this point, he has been, he has served time for child molestation. He has raped multiple women 
and they just let him on this dating show? Girl, 1979, what? we are going to get to the crime that finally puts him in jail for good and lands him with the death penalty. And that is the murder of Robin Samso. Robin was 12 years old. She was a ballet dancer. She had worked out this deal where her family couldn't afford ballet classes, but ballet was her dream. It was what she wanted to do. And so her studio was allowing her to work answering the phones at the studio in order to pay for her classes. And so the day that she was abducted was supposed to be her first day working at the ballet studio answering the phones. And it was, she had a little bit of time before she had to go to the ballet studio. So she hung out with her best friend, Bridget, and they went to the beach. And while they're at the beach, Rodney approaches them and he says, hey, can I take your pictures? I'm working on this contest, this photo contest. And if you win, you could get money. And they're like, oh, sure, you know, because every 12 year old girl wants to be a model. Like it's so flattering. And so they're posing for these pictures. But this older adult woman who knows these two girls and does not know Rodney sees him taking their pictures and she's like, oh no, this is creepy. Like you stop it. And so she comes up to him and she does that older lady thing of like, you stay away from them, you nasty old perv. And Rodney runs away and she's like, you two need to go home. And so they go back to Bridget's and it's time for Robin to go to ballet. And so she borrows Bridget's bike and she's never seen Part of my it. research for this, there is a 48 hours documentary on Rodney Alcala and Robin's mom is one of the main people who's interviewed for that documentary. And I've been, I've been watching true crime stuff and studying true crime things for a long time. Like I haven't been doing these videos for a long time, but I've been into true crime for years and years and years. And that interview with Robin's mom is the most impactful thing that I have ever listened Robin's to. Robin's mom talks about when the body was found and her body was just unrecognizable. And she says that the police told her that they had found Robin. She was like, okay, well, I'm gonna go see Robin. They were like, you, you can't go see Robin. And she said, what do you mean? Like, she's, she's my daughter. I'm her mom. I get to go see her. And they were like, you don't understand. Like, it took us three days to identify the body. And they were like, well, that's stupid. Like, how many little blonde girls are missing in this area? Like, she has blonde hair. You should be able to tell from that. And they said, there was no hair. And that's just... That line on its own has stuck with me. Like, I watched this for the first time years ago, and I didn't realize that that was this case, and whenever I saw that again, I... The ugh. files for the Robin Samso murder were just a debacle. He appealed, and his case got thrown out, and they had to do it again. It was just years, decades, that her family had to relive this over and over and over again. And at one point, he decided that he was going to represent himself at his final trial. And he put Robin's mom on the stand and was berating her and calling her a liar. He put himself on the stand and he used two different voices, like one for lawyer Rodney and one for witness Rodney. And he was just, it was clearly just a show that he was putting on for the sake of his own entertainment. Because at, at that point, everybody knew that he did it. It didn't matter. One of the big pieces of evidence was that they had a storage locker that Rodney had rented that had a pair of earrings that Robin's mother identified as the earrings that she was wearing that day that she had borrowed from her. And Rodney was arguing that, oh, there are no pictures of Robin that show that her ears are pierced. And um, he plays the clip of him from the dating game to show that his ears were pierced, even though it doesn't really, like you can't really see his ears very well in the video because he has his long but hair. Robin's earrings were not the only earrings in that storage locker. There were a lot of earrings. And one of the earrings, earring sets 
was matched to the DNA of Charlotte Lamb, who was another one of his victims. She was 31 and she was murdered in the laundry room of her apartment complex. In his closing argument in his final trial, he plays a song that is about the war, like the Vietnam War. And in the song, this man is pretending to be insane to like get out of being drafted. And he's just talking about how he wants to kill people. He wants veins in his teeth and just all of this, this violent, horrible tirade. And nobody really, I don't understand how that was supposed to help his defense. I don't think it was even meant to. I think that this was just Rodney sharing this song with people because he was using this as his little forum to say and do whatever and he After wanted. he is found guilty in that trial, the victims from all of his cases, not just Robin Samso's, were allowed to give victim impact statements. And so people's families from, he had a lot of victims and a lot of those families testified. One of them was a brother of a woman who was killed and he testified about having to go into her apartment after she was murdered and seeing it was just covered in blood and having to clean all of it up. And one of the mothers of the women who was killed, she um, she was put in a mental hospital because her mental health got so bad after her daughter was murdered and she never got over it for the rest and of And of course, life. on the witness stand, we have Tally Shapiro, who at this point is a grown ass woman and she is furious. She says, you know, this happened to me decades ago when I was eight years old and he got three years. Like it should not, this man having an opportunity to kill other people should not depend on the emotional fortitude of an eight-year-old girl. Like, they had enough evidence to put him away without her testimony. Yeah, he's still in jail. He got the death penalty, but he hasn't been killed yet. He is still there. He wrote a book called You the Jury, which I am not gonna read, would not recommend. I bet it's terrible. So I'm gonna go ahead and read out the names of all of the confirmed victims and then we're gonna be done. So, Tali Shapiro, Cornelia Crilly. We have Julie J, who that's not a real name, it's an alias because she was underage and she did survive. Ellen Hover, Antoinette Whitaker, Jill Barkham, Georgia Wickstead, Pamela Jean Lamson, Christine Ruth Thornton, Joyce Gaunt, Charlotte Lamb, Jill Parento, and Robin Samso. And probably a whole lot more. The next case that I'm gonna cover is the case of Maria Del Rosio Alfaro. She killed one person in California in 1990. Let's find out what happened. <laughs> 